Whether it's through religion, seance, shaman, or personal prayer, we all share the universal desire to communicate with the dead. What does it feel like to die? Do loved ones watch over us from another dimension? Is there life after death? Hello, I'm Tim White. And on this special edition of Sightings, we may talk to the dead, but do they talk back? Someone died in this basement. On this special edition of Sightings, in New York, an entire neighborhood fights back against uninvited visitors. It's not just this house, and it's not just Stephanie's house. It's a haunted neighborhood. Do the dead attack? This man has lived in the most haunted house in America and suffered the consequences. This is the same thing that occurs when Holy she's scratched his face. And this is like the most profound thing I've ever seen in all parapsychology, and you have it on tape. Can the dead live again? A World War I soldier dies violently, but is he alive today? I know my little boy really experienced what he said he did. There's no doubt in my mind. Can the dead save the living? Love transcends death, and a boy is given a second chance at life. It's not very often you get a miracle in your life and then confirmation of it in the same day. Compelling new testimony from the living, who say they've been contacted by the dead. I looked out the window, and there's this little girl's face. She had, like, curly hair. It had to be a ghost. It's a sighting special, in-depth and beyond. The Living Dead, speaking from the grave. According to a recent poll, seeing, hearing, or feeling the presence of a spirit is the most common type of paranormal encounter. More than 125 million people, more than half of all Americans, will have some type of ghostly encounter in their lifetime. Belief in the presence of the spirit world on Earth crosses all social, cultural, and economic boundaries, and can count among its believers some of history's greatest thinkers and greatest charlatans. For eons, the mysteries of life have often focused on death. Civilizations dating back to ancient times devised elaborate preparations for the inevitable. Almost all human cultures, human societies, have a belief in an afterlife, that when a person dies, when you leave this state of being, you're going somewhere. So if you look at the earliest documents that we find for most cultures, it's spiritual, religious symbols, imagery, texts, which invariably reference something beyond this world. The ancient Egyptians definitely had a view of the afterlife. Uh, the human soul went on in the afterlife, and this is the reason for the artifacts being left in the tomb of the dead person. And it hasn't only been Egyptian pharaohs looking for a way to move beyond their physical existence on Earth. There has always been an endless fascination with the tantalizing possibility of immortality that life after death offers. There's an intuitive knowing that life ex extends beyond our physical body. We are a spirit, we are a soul, wearing a body right here, right now. And death is nothing more than taking off the body and casting it aside. In the late 1840s, two sisters in Hydesville, New York, caused a stir when word spread that they were able to contact the dead. Maggie and Kate Fox claimed the departed spirit signaled them by making tapping sounds. A public, eager to believe them, embraced the Fox sisters as the first prominent mediums, and a new movement was born, spiritualism. When spiritualism came along, of course, people were baffled by the phenomenon. They did not understand what these tappings or what these sightings were. There seems to be a need of people to, to realize that there's a part of our being that is eternal. The sisters invited people to their home to witness the astonishing contacts they seemed to be making, and the movement grew rapidly. 
But Maggie shocked the world 30 years later when she confessed that their seances were hoaxes. Despite her confession, which she later retracted, the spiritualist movement thrived as a new charismatic leader emerged. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was probably the most learned person in the 19th century regarding a view of the afterlife. Though she also conducted seances, Blavatsky was best known as a visionary who introduced Eastern religion and spiritual thinking into the Western world. In her writings, she explained human existence as a succession of reincarnations in which each rebirth moves us closer to a supreme spiritual state. Americans are still fascinated with seances, spiritualism, and belief in after-death communication. But how does modern science deal with a movement so anchored in simple faith? The goal is to sync up the ancient wisdom, take the eternal truths, the occult knowledge, and synthesize it with modern science. Then there'll be one explanation. No matter how varied the phenomena is, it will only come down to one explanation, because truth is truth. As we approach the 21st century, paranormal investigators are using a vast array of sophisticated scientific equipment to analyze spirit encounters. Often difficult to explain, compelling evidence is routinely uncovered. If there are, in fact, apparitions, if we are, in fact, surviving death, this certainly is one of the most important questions we can ever look into as human beings. It is something that has tremendous implications about what we are, about who we are, and about what life really is. The whole world is looking for the same answers to the same questions. And it's the soul's inner yearning, that divine ray in each and every one of us, that is pushing us on in this pilgrimage called life. Judging by the history of haunting phenomena, ghosts are homebodies. The physical body may rest in the grave, but the spirit doesn't. It appears in places and to people who knew it best. And there are some places and some people who seem to be, in a sense, ghost magnets, consistently drawing supernatural energy from the next world into this. Nestled in New York's Hudson Valley, a two-hour drive from Manhattan is the town of Beacon, the region had been a vibrant industrial hub throughout the 1800s, but Father Time and the lure of the big city for those who'd grown up here have been hard on the little beacon. Many homes in the area are more than a century old, and it was this history and the quaint character of the community that first attracted Julie Cohen and her ex-husband to Beacon in 1985. They bought this charming house built in the 1800s. And I loved it, and I wanted it. Julie and her ex-husband began an extensive renovation of the interiors. The house was in dire need um, of some pretty hefty work. It had a wood-burning stove, the dining room floor had been cemented, the floors were painted red, and they ha everything had to be done. So we did that, and we worked day and night, and the last step was sanding the floors before we could move our furniture in. Julie's ex-husband and a friend stained and urethane the wood floors, then left, locking up the house so that no one could walk on the wet floors. But when they returned several hours later, they found the small, dusty footprints of what appeared to be a barefoot child who'd walked across the floor. Julie's ex-husband was furious. He thought a neighborhood child must have broken into the locked house. But then Julie made an amazing discovery. To check the floor to see if there had been any damage, I brushed away the dust, the dirt from the floor, and it was tacky, but there was nothing there. There was no more imprint, no foot. It was gone. What I felt was very strange about the whole thing was whoever walked on the floor would have left an imprint in the floor because the floor was wet and tacky from the urethane, and there was nothing there. There was no imprint. There was nothing. Not long afterward, Julie and her mother were painting an upstairs bedroom. An old radio tuned to a rock station suddenly and inexplicably changed to another station. The first time that the radio changed on its own, I was in the bathroom and I was cleaning brushes. And I had my music on and all of a sudden, it started going out of tune. 
So I went over to put it back, and I could actually see the dial moving and changing to a different song, to a different station, a softer station, softer music, not my rock and roll. And I actually would watch the thing turn and watch the dial move. And I'd move it back, and it would move it back, and i just stop fighting with it. And said, okay, you win. There were many nights during that period of renovation when Julie would be awakened by one strange sound or another. There was a child crying in the distance, doors opening and closing by themselves, heavy footsteps on the back staircase when no one was there. After their renovation was completed, the paranormal activity seemed to settle down until Julie gave birth to her first child. I was breastfeeding, and I'd walk into his room, and the crib would be down. The rails, it was a brand new crib, and the crib rail side would be down. So I'd look, and I'd lift it up, and I'd feed him, and I'd put him back to bed, and it'd be up, and in the morning, I'd go in, and the crib would be down. Julie's ex-husband checked the crib and found nothing wrong with the railing mechanism but the strange activity continued. And finally, I'm feeding him, my oldest, and I'm sitting in the rocking chair, and the closet door opens a little bit, and I hear the noise, and I said to myself, it's a little girl. She's doing it. It's got to be, because the crib's not broken. And I said, it's OK. I know you love the baby, and I know you want to be with the baby. But you can't put the crib side down anymore because the baby could get hurt. And you can sit with me while I feed the baby, and you don't have to be afraid, and we don't want you to go anywhere. It's OK. And the crib never opened again after that. Julie became convinced that the spirit of a little girl was living in the old house with her family, and she felt sure that the spirit meant them no harm. For 10 years, during which time Julie had a second child and also was divorced, she continued to feel comfortable with her unseen visitor. But in the fall of 1996, city engineers began to tear up the street in front of her house to lay a new sewer line. This seemed to disturb the entity on a profound and terrifying new level. I would be laying in bed, sleeping, or even sitting watching TV, and my bedroom door would open shut open, close, but not just once, it would just go slam, slam, open, shut, open, shut, open, shut, open, shut, and then it would just stop, and I'd sit there like, I mean, I wouldn't even move, because I was scared, because I didn't know what it was, I mean, I knew what it was, but I just wanted to stop. In a homespun attempt at spiritual cleansing, Julie bought a small bird feeder, which had a statue of St. Francis of Assisi in the center, and hung it in her living room. She sprinkled the statue with holy water and placed white sage and white votive candles all around it. When Julie lit the candles for the first time, it seemed to evoke the spirit in her house. I was laying on the couch, and I was looking at St. Francis and watching the light. You know, it was so pretty. And all of a sudden, as I looked up at it, it just started turning, started moving in a circular motion. And I just watched it for a few minutes thinking, am I really seeing this? And then it stopped. And I looked again, and it went in the other direction. When Julie revealed her experiences to her neighbors, they didn't think she was crazy because they told Julie that it was happening at their homes too. Across the street and three doors down, Stephanie Knapp, her husband and her three children had moved into their home around the same time Julie Cohen moved into hers. Amanda was the first member of her family to witness haunting activity when an electric typewriter in her room took on a life of its own. My friend slept over and she like passed out. And we were sitting there and then she fell asleep so I was just sitting there and I couldn't sleep and the typewriter just started like flipping out. Like all the buttons were going but it wasn't plugged in and it wasn't turned off. And then there was like shuffle papers underneath that were just like flying around. And then I just like tried going to sleep and it wouldn't go away and I started screaming and then it stopped. The Knapps were also doing renovations to their turn of the century home. Amanda's stepfather was digging out the basement to make room for a new bedroom. Amanda, who was only six at the time, 
was helping him one day when together they made a grisly discovery. And then we went down there and we started digging. And then we got like halfway through it. And then we saw this hand. It was exactly like this. But it was all bones, like no skin, just like straight bones. But you could see, tell it was a hand. And then after that, he just like stopped digging. And then that was it. Today, some 12 years later, the basement remains in the same condition it was on the day he and Amanda discovered the hand. Amanda says she and her sister buried the skeletal remains in the backyard. The kids have told me about it. I have to admit I didn't believe them at first. But he's never touched the basement again. And as you've seen, I still have a large hole in my basement. I don't go down there very often. That's the one place that really kind of bothers me. Just this year, after the birth of her first child, Amanda had a frightening late-night encounter with an apparition. It was early in the morning. My daughter woke up, and then like, you could hear someone crying. Like, it was like an older person crying, not a baby crying. And then all I heard is, help me, help me. And I looked out the window, and there's this little girl's face. She had, like, curly hair. Help me. And you could just see the tears pouring off of her eyes. And I was like, can I help you? And then she just kept screaming, help me, help me. And then I went upstairs and got my mom, and then I came back downstairs, and she was gone. But there's no way that it could be, like, a real person, because the window comes up to, like, here on me. And she stopped, like, right here, and her hair was, like, right here. So she had to be floating, because she could not stand on that ground. After searching for a logical explanation, there is now no doubt in the minds of the Knapp family that their home is under the influence of paranormal forces. And a lot of people have come to my house, sat in my house, and left believing there's something in my house because things have happened. They have felt the cold, they have, they have seen things, they feel things, and it's unexplainable. Then most people leave thinking I have something in my house and they get nervous coming back. You can't make anybody believe unless they're here to feel it. Because I gotta tell you, I've watched people on television and I've said, oh yeah, their house is haunted, uh-huh. Sure, but they've got to be here. Two houses, three doors apart, both inhabited by forces that seem to be from another dimension. And, say Julie and Stephanie, they are not the only families in Beacon who are being haunted. I have heard about a lot of houses in the area that have, they say that things go on in their home, but they don't really tell a lot of people about it because they don't want it to be known. Everybody at one time has felt something. And still are, but they just don't want to talk about it because they don't want people to think they're crazy. With so much bizarre activity witnessed by so many people over so many years, there's no doubt that this neighborhood in upstate New York is haunted. But by what? That's what Julie Cohen wants to know. And that's what Julie Cohen has asked an investigative team to find out. Coming up next, the entities on this haunted street make their presence known during a sightings investigation. You can feel right it. Right here, put your... Tell him right it's here. okay, that I can leave. Calm down, yeah, him. calm down here. And later, this man's alive today because he says the dead can speak from beyond the grave. The most common cause for a haunting is a sudden violent death. Certainly, if there's a body buried in the basement, it would be a significant reason for a haunting to take place in that environment. The eerie and frightening experiences encountered by Julie Cohen and the Knapp family of Beacon, New York, have been occurring for more than a decade. The frightening sounds, ghostly imagery, and moving objects continue. Are there rational explanations for what's happening on their street? Or could they truly be the result of the presence of spirits from another time? Before the arrival of a sightings investigative team, Julie Cohen had already worked with paranormal investigator Randy Liebeck. Skeptical by nature, Liebeck is a police detective who investigates haunted houses in his off hours. He became convinced that something strange was happening in Julie's house the night he witnessed the inexplicable movement of a talisman Julie had made to ward off evil spirits. I actually observed it moving. 
I was here from another investigator, and we were setting up some surveillance equipment in the dining room. I turned and looked, and I saw the incense burner spinning around in a circular arc. And I told my colleague who saw it, he thought I had pushed it, trying to fool him. And I uh, told him, no, it wasn't me. We physically stopped it with our hands, stopped the movement, stood back, and it started spinning again. And he saw it begin this time. And it spun for a while, then stopped. Again, we tried to recreate it. We tried stomping, shaking, the, pounding the walls, walking upstairs, stomping. It wouldn't budge. So I cannot figure out what on earth made it spin the time that I saw it. After reviewing all of the experiences Julie and her family had had in their home, Liebeck was particularly impressed by the story of the dusty footprints on the newly refinished wood floor. The thing that intrigued me was that the floor was still tacky wet from being varnished, and the footprints did not adhere, stick, or sink into the varnish. It was like a light dusting of some sort of dust or powder, which uh, I cannot figure out how on earth that could have been done. If somebody had walked across the floor physically, there would have had to have been impressions left permanently in the varnish. So whatever walked across the floor had no mass, had no weight. And uh, I can't think of anything that could cause that except for your classical imagery of a ghost lightly walking across the floor. Based on all of the Cohen's experiences, Liebeck has come to a controversial conclusion. This house is haunted, yes. There are a variety of explanations and definitions of the word haunted. And the phenomena that's occurring here is real. What Julie and the other people have experienced, they have actually experienced. What I have experienced in this house is real. The question is the causative factors. Is it the spirit of a dead person? There's no way that I can tell that. In an effort to determine the nature of the spirits in the Cohen and Knapp homes, Sightings put together an investigative team, including a surveillance expert who set up four closed-circuit cameras to monitor the homes for an uninterrupted 24-hour period. Under the guidance of Randy Liebeck, three of the cameras were placed in the Cohen home, one in the former nursery, one looking down the main staircase, and one in the room where several people had witnessed the swinging talisman. A fourth camera was placed in the basement of the Knapp home, while the surveillance cameras tape recorded continuous picture and sound, sightings also brought in psychic investigator Peter James. Peter was given no information about the haunting activity in Beacon. In fact, he had no idea what town he would be traveling to until he arrived. The only people allowed in the two houses during the investigation were a four-person sightings crew, Peter James and Randy Liebeck, who had a magnetometer to check for anomalous electromagnetism. Peter began in Julie Cohen's house. Julie was in the process of moving to a different house when these pictures were taken. Peter was immediately drawn to the room where the swinging incense burner had been sighted. There's a cold spot here, and that to me um, would be an indicator, if you will, that uh, this is like a vortex. This is like a dimensional entrance, if you will, where where they, meaning the, the entities, ghosts, spirits, um, enter from, leave through, or it's, 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 or it's also a source of energy. Something is with us right now. Something is right here. <coughs> uh, listen, listen. There's, there's a young, there's, a, there's also, a, I think, a child here as well. In the nursery, where Julie had so often felt the presence of a little girl and had even spoken to her, Peter James also felt a strong presence. Again, Peter had been told nothing of Julie's experiences prior to this visit. This room, there is yet a separate, uh, a separate energy, and I strongly feel uh, that someone died in this room. There's a lot of sadness. I'm saddened by the way this person died in this room. Uh, I think the, the, the death that I'm feeling in this room was unexpected and, uh, and, and, and young. I feel very young about this energy. There's like, I think about uh, three or four people have died in this house over the years. As Peter James and the sightings team continued to move through the house, Julie Cohen abruptly burst in, obviously shaken, off camera, she told us that she had had a frightening premonition. She was sure that whoever or whatever was inhabiting the house did not want her to leave. 
At that moment, both she and Peter felt the presence of a male entity. In the house. I can feel her. He's right here right now. Hello? <clears throat> I can, he's near me. Whoa, he's right here. I can feel right him. Right here. Put your... Tell him right it's here. okay that I can calm leave. Calm down. Yeah, him. calm down here. Previously, not today, but on previous visits, this location, one of my investigators detected an electrical tingling sensation in the air at this spot at about this elevation. Mm -hmm. And I detected a magnetic flux in this Whoa. area. When Peter moved down the block to the nap home, he was instantly overcome by a sense of the dead and dying. It feels like something was done many years ago with um, there there is a there is a mortuary uh, a person like a mortician or an embalmer that was involved in this house he instinctively moved down into the basement and began to sense that this location was the source of the haunting activity in the neighborhood again peter did not know anything about what the naps say they found here 12 years ago Someone died in this basement. Someone died down here, and I think, uh, again, I'm, I'm getting that uh, uh, kind of a mystery death syndrome. There's something unusual in this basement. I'm reading a fluctuating magnetic field stronger than any of the other places we've come across yet. Now, if I went up closer to the wiring in the ceiling, it's going to spike because it's close to electrical conduit. But there's no reason at all for any field down here and the hole in the floor. But I am reading a uh, you know, fluctuating field, which is stronger than anywhere else in the house. And there's nothing in the ground here which should be generating any sort of field. And now is that, are they walking in the house? At the same time that Randy Liebeck's magnetometer began to fluctuate, Peter James heard a sound upstairs in the supposedly empty house. The entire team listened and heard the sound of heavy footsteps running across the floor above. Peter James asked that the home's owner, Stephanie Knapp, come in to see if she had a rational explanation. Well, we heard distinct sounds, right, gentlemen? Yeah, there was no doubt about it. No doubt, very, like some very, very heavy, across. heavy feet. Heavy, 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 heavy feet. Yeah, <clears throat> we were outside. Okay. Strangely, the surveillance camera's audio recorder did not pick up the distinctive sound, even though everyone in the basement had heard it clearly. Because part of your basement has a dirt floor. I don't want to say someone was buried. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sensationalize this, but I feel that someone died in your basement. A man died in the basement, a male. Within minutes, Stephanie's neighbor, Julie, arrived. Again, drawn by a sense that an entity was present in the area. Randy, what do you got? We hear footsteps uh, above us. Yeah, Randy. Above us. Below us on the stairs heading to the it's basement. Cold. It's cold. It's very cold right here. There's someone here right now. Hello, who's here? Identify yourself now. He's at my knees. Yeah, I just uh, experienced a significant EM flux right by your knees. Okay. Relax, honey. No, I'm okay. I'm, I've had this in this house before. Listen. It's okay. The stairs are creaking. Listen. After everything that had happened in the Beacon houses that night, Peter James offered a startling challenge to the Knapp family. I would wager to say that if someone did some kind of excavating, if you will, and, and dug up that basement, that you'd find a full uh, skeletal remains of, of, of a body down there. <clears throat> and I think that's the nature of your hunting. That's what's causing the anomalous activity, the sounds, the, um, the, the cold spots, and which are, which are certainly ways to, to confirm the fact that this man died tragically in this house. That's what I feel. Following Peter's suggestion, and with the permission of Stephanie Knapp, sightings hired an excavation crew to dig into the dirt floor of the family's basement. The crew worked for three hours, excavating the area where Peter had felt there was a dead body. They dug until the crew chief called a halt. Further excavation could compromise the structural integrity of the house. No skeletal remains were found. Review of the 24-hour surveillance footage also revealed no anomalous activity. Despite the lack of new evidence, Peter James remains convinced that the source of the haunting in this neighborhood is related to something that happened long ago in the basement of the Knapp home. Human remains have been found here, and Peter believes that until those remains are identified, at least one restless spirit will continue to wreak havoc in Beacon, New York.
In the meantime, Randy Liebeck offers this advice to the families. Uh, one of the things we uh, counsel people on, I counsel people on, when they have a haunting event in their house and they're frightened by it, I tell them, I say, well, have you tried talking with the ghost? Lay down some ground rules, explain to it that this is your house, you're the boss here, and either the ghost is not welcome or if it is to be welcome, there are certain ground rules. And in many cases, I and other investigators have found that when the percipient addresses the ghost or the entity in the house, lays down these ground rules, the phenomena does modify itself to work within those guidelines. The Knapps have never considered moving out of their Beacon home, but Stephanie and Amanda almost never go in the basement. Julie Cohen has followed through on her plans to move out, but not because the house is haunted. In fact, she is willing to work with Randy Liebeck to search for scientific proof of her experiences. What's happened here is a gift that we can share, and that researchers can now, and that's where my commitment came in, because Randy helped me get through this at a really bad time, and it's real. I don't know what else to say, is that it's real. While the sightings team conducted its investigation, Julie and her family packed up everything and moved out of their house, out of the haunted neighborhood. Since then, Julie reports, the ghostly encounters have stopped and life is back to normal. Next on Sightings, can the dead really speak to us from beyond the grave to save a life? It's not very often you get a miracle in your life and then confirmation of it in the same day. Death does not separate the living from the dead. The most frequent kind of after-death communication is feeling the presence. You just know that your loved one is near you. Because Harry Houdini vowed that if there was any way to communicate from beyond the grave, he would, and he hasn't, skeptics say that that proves that there's no such thing as after-death communication. But what if speaking from beyond the grave isn't a choice that's ours to make? What if it's a gift bestowed on a special few whom we call guardian angels? Today, Walt and Dave Franzak paint a perfect picture of American family values. Father and son work side by side at the family-owned garage in Wyandotte, Michigan. But what isn't apparent on the surface are the eerie events that led them to this point. A brush with death a startling apparition, and the voice of Dave's father from beyond the grave. Unlike his son, Dave Franzak did not have a good relationship with his own father, Walter Sr. He would uh, come home, uh, usually intoxicated, and uh, he'd just bring up something that I had done incorrect maybe a week before, and uh, he'd start yelling, hollering at me, and take his belt off, and just beat the daylights out of me. I used to go and date Dave. We used to go over to his house, and his dad would be passed out in the chair. And a lot of times he didn't want me to come over, which it was kind of embarrassing. Soon after Dave and Joanne got married, Walter Franzak contracted tuberculosis. He was confined to a sanitarium and was not there when his first grandchild and his namesake, Little Walt, was born. But when Walter Sr. was released from the hospital two years later, he was clean and sober, and his grandson was the apple of his eye. He referred to him affectionately as the kid. The conversation always started, did you bring the kid with you? I mean, that was primary. He didn't care about anything else as long as we brought Walt along. I'd go in the living room and sit on his lap. Uh, we'd sit there and watch TV together. I'd lay my head on his shoulder and sit there, and they'd play cards occasionally in the kitchen. And when they did, I'd sit on his lap then. I used to look at him and his actions, and I could see the love in his eye for Walt and how he would fuss over him and that. And uh, I used to think back, gee, it would have been nice when I was young if we could have had a relationship like that. And the magical relationship between grandfather and grandson ended abruptly when little Walt was only six years old. It was right around my birthday time. We were supposed to have a party and that. My dad pulled me off to the side 
and had told me he was sick and you know he was no longer sick anymore he he went up to heaven and his suffering and pain and that was all over now and I should I, it's okay to miss him but I shouldn't feel bad or feel you know sorry because he's gone just try and remember the good times and and be happy for him because all of his pain and suffering was over I, I wished I had seen him awake once more and I don't know maybe that was the time I was gonna tell him dad I love you and I, I never got that opportunity several weeks after the death of his father Dave and Joanne decided to take their family on a long overdue vacation to a rustic cabin on Sugar Island near Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. It was a warm weekend morning when life and death collided in one near tragic moment. When I was trying to see if I could see the Sioux locks through the binoculars, I, I, I really couldn't. Meanwhile, Walt came out and he says, Dad, can I go play on the inner tube in the water? We had taken a couple of new inner tubes along. And I says, yes, but I says, stay close to shore. And, you know, when you get out, it's very deep and it's a swift current. Every now and then, I just look at him, and he's paddling around. He's doing just fine. Walt didn't know how to swim. He needed the inner tube to keep him afloat in the deep lake water. Dave Franzak only looked away for a second, but a second was long enough to change his life forever. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking, and all of a sudden, my dad's voice, as plain as day, behind me said, watch the kid. And it's, it's still hard for me to talk about it. You can see the goosebumps. And uh, I looked, and there was an empty inner tube floating way downstream. You talk about your life flashing in front of you. I said to myself, how in the world am I going to tell my wife I let our son drown right in front of me when I'm an excellent swimmer? The sun was shining on the water. The water was kind of still, and I looked and I seen what I thought was like three or four little fingertips sticking up out of the water. So I dropped the binoculars and I ran fully dressed as far as I could. Then I dove under the water and I looked and I thought I seen Walt's outline. And so I reached and I grabbed it and it was him. So I turned around, I swam back to where I could stand up and I picked him up out of the water and looked at him. He wasn't breathing and his eyes literally looked like they were popping out. So I threw Walt over my shoulder. As I'm running up the hill to the house, he's bouncing up and down on my shoulder. And he started coughing and gagging. You know, I, I did artificial respiration without even realizing it. And he started breathing again. I heard them call my name. I grabbed it. They said, Dwayne. Joanne, get a blanket. I grabbed a blanket, and as I'm running down the hill, I see Dave running up the hill with Walt on his shoulder. Without the voice of his father, Dave says, he would have missed seeing those little fingertips reaching up out of the water. And when little Walt told his parents that he had seen a vision of his grandfather as he slipped under the water, Dave realized that the voice he'd heard was not just in his head. One time I had floated out a little bit and slid right through the inner tube and went underwater. And uh, while I was underwater, that is where I seen my grandfather. When I, when I went down under the water, as plain as we're sitting here right now, I could see my grandfather in front of me and he just brought this calm feeling about me. First thing he did was, just like a kid does, they, he held his breath. I could see his cheeks puff out like he was trying to show me to hold my breath. And he reached with his right hand, plugged his nose, and with his left hand, started paddling like toward the top of the water to show me to pull myself up. Started kicking his feet. And at six years old, I looked at all that. And it it looked, looked quite funny, comical. It looked like he was trying to show me tricks and, and playing with me and stuff. And the next thing I remembered after that was on my dad's shoulder with him running and uh, choking and stuff like that because of the water that was in me. I, I just started crying. I couldn't talk anymore. It's still hard to talk about it today. It's not very often you get a miracle in your life and then confirmation of it in the same day. Thirty years later, father and son still work side by side because of a spiritual connection to their shared past. Both are convinced that they've been touched by the afterlife. Beyond the slightest doubt in my mind, there is a life after this life. And I, I just... There's nothing anybody could say to make me believe any different.
The way I look at it or explain it, I think maybe after everyone passes away, maybe you were allowed at least one trip back to Earth to do something, to help someone. I, I think everybody has some sort of guardian angel. That was my grandfather. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. I, I feel God used an angel through my father. He gave me the greatest gift any father could give his son. He gave me my son. So it made up for everything. You know, he could have been bad another 20 years and it still would have made up for it. Coming up on Sightings, a chilling encounter. The spirit of a young man returns one year after he committed suicide. I believe it thoroughly and entirely and deep in my soul that life goes on, that there is life after death. People who lose their lives, it sometimes is a very frustrating experience for them because they're always trying to communicate many times with a loved one that they're okay and they didn't have that opportunity to do that. An eerie apparition, things that go bump then bang then crash in the night. A chilling moan or a whispered warning from beyond the grave. A haunting can be a terrifying life-changing experience but it doesn't have to be. Many people report that the sight or sound of a departed loved one is a comfort, a sign that there's a better world beyond this one. Is it wishful thinking, a hallucination, or have some people been given a glimpse, for reasons we don't understand, of the afterlife? Dear family, why? That must be the question on your mind right now. I don't know, really, not for sure. I am in death what I was in life, an enigma to those around me and to myself. The voice you've been listening to is the actual voice of 27-year-old Peter Bosco. On March 18, 1991, Peter recorded the tape, wrote his mother a loving note, then left his Brookfield, Connecticut home. He walked along a lakeside path and committed suicide. Peter's mother, Antoinette, found the tape and a suicide note. She called the police and was listening to the tape when there was a fateful knock at the door. Before the tape was halfway through, uh, the police were back at the door, and I went running to the door, and he said, we found him. I said, alive? Because I still had the hope they were going to find him alive. And uh, he said, uh, no. Peter Bosco had killed himself with a single gunshot to the head. The pain and sorrow caused by his suicide can never be erased, but Antoinette Bosco has found strength and inner peace through what she believes has been an after-death communication with her son. Peter Bosco's 27 years of life presented his mother with a challenging journey, but one that began with great joy. Peter was the youngest of seven children. He was so beautiful and so delightful and so wonderful that he became the kind of the centerpiece of the whole family. All the love that we had, we could lavish on that child. But when Peter turned 17, Antoinette had her first inkling of what was to come. I was at work at, uh, at the university, and I got a call from a neighbor, actually, uh, who said, uh, this is very strange but your son was here, and he said he's going to commit suicide. And I started to laugh. I said, oh, I said, well, Pete's such a jokester. I said, what was going on? And she said, no, he said he left a suicide note. The police found Peter alive, meditating in a park. Ten years later, on the suicide tape he left behind, there was an explanation for why Peter had contemplated suicide back then and why he didn't go through with it. I was um, seized with excitement one night and off the next morning to, uh, to meet my end. It was such a thrill that it snapped me out of the malaise I'd been trapped in. Antoinette knew then that Peter needed some form of psychiatric treatment. She checked her son into a hospital for observation. The diagnosis was not what she expected. The doctor said to me, your son is hopelessly schizophrenic. When the onset is adolescence, it is permanent. He will be hospitalized and institutionalized most of his life. And uh, excuse my saying this, but I told him to go to hell. 
because, hey, this was my son they were talking about. Antoinette sought a second opinion from another psychiatrist who felt that Peter was not schizophrenic but was suffering from severe but curable adolescent depression. Antoinette took her son out of the psychiatric hospital against the advice of the original physician. He said, if you take him out, he said, and he commits suicide, his blood will be on your hands. This man actually said that to me. And I said, all I know is that if I leave him in here, that's when his blood will be on my hands. Peter's new psychiatrist treated him throughout the remainder of his high school years. He went to the University of Connecticut and graduated cum laude. After college, Peter went to Guam to teach math in a Catholic school. A year later, he returned home to write a book about World War I, which was published to much critical acclaim. And I thought then, great, we have finally found it. We finally found what he was meant to be. And then he wrote a proposal for a book on the War of 1812 and went to another publisher right here in Connecticut. And the book was immediately accepted. Peter's positive outlook infused his family, and there were signs that he was planning for the future. I had always wanted to have a, a row of uh, evergreen trees. We went to a farm, and we bought a number of seedlings, and Peter planted them all across the, uh, the back of the yard. We watched them, and we took great pride in it. The photos of Peter on his book covers show a handsome, confident, scholarly man, but on the inside, Peter felt that he was none of these things. My life is like a Rolls Royce without spark plugs. It looks great, but it has a hidden flaw that keeps it from running properly. On the morning of March 18, 1991, Antoinette Bosco was on her way to work when she found a long note and an envelope on the windshield of her car. The envelope told police where to find Peter's body. The note on yellow legal paper and another found with the tape was addressed to Mom. He said, Dear Mom, as I write this note, I am a doomed man. For some reason, my will to live has been inhibited. Feel no guilt, for there is no fault. Weep not for me, for mine was a pleasant and joyful life. Be happy for your son, for like a wave closing on a drowning man, my suffering is ended. Know that I loved you dearly. On the Easter Sunday following Peter's death, Antoinette awakened to the sound of gentle tapping. Peter's ashes had been delivered from the crematorium only the day before, and now two bright red birds were tapping on the window just inches away from Peter's urn. I thought, oh my God, they must have come from Peter, because in much of my research, I had always been aware of the fact that people seem to communicate with loved ones who have gone through nature. But then I said, Peter, I think you sent the birds, but I've seen cardinals before. I want to know you're happy with God in heaven. I want to see a white bird, which I'd never seen in Connecticut. The days passed with no sign from a white bird. Then, on April 18th, one month to the day after Peter's death, Antoinette was in her son's room reading a book that Peter had been urging her to read before his death. She found a passage that he'd underlined. It said that when a mother loses a child, she should not feel guilty because guilt only drains energy at a time when it's drastically needed. At that very moment, Antoinette looked up, and through the window, she saw something that sent a chill up her spine. And there, sitting on the ground at the base of one of the little spruces that he had planted was the white bird. I can tell you, my heart started to go, you know, and I, I jumped up and I looked out. It was not a very large bird, not as large as a dove, pure white except for a little black marking on its head. And as I looked at it, it began to fly upward and it circled the tree and then flew straight up. And I remember just, I don't know if I was crying or laughing or what I was doing, but I was just saying, thanks, Pete, thanks, and thank you, Lord. And now I know, now I've had my sign and I know he's happy with the Lord in heaven. And I knew it was a real gift. Antoinette wanted to be sure that the sign wasn't just a case of wishful thinking. She researched bird life in Connecticut and found that no one had ever seen such a bird in the area. Then, on May 18th, two months to the day after Peter's death, the same bird made another appearance at the home of Peter's sister, Margie. I walked out of the house and I was about to go shopping. 
And my son Florian, who was about five years old at the time, all of a sudden he said, Mama, look, look. And I looked and there was this very, very bright, beautiful white bird on the lawn. And I started to walk and approach it. And as I approached the bird, I noticed a couple of little black stripes just on the back of the head of the bird. And then the bird began to fly up this tree and it was like spiraling, spiraling around the tree, around the tree. And then it flew off and it just flew, flew, flew into the sky. And I just watched it with my eyes until I couldn't see it anymore, until it just disappeared. I knew instantly it was a sign. It was, it, Pete wanted to comfort us and to know that it was, it was a message, that, that it was a sign of peace, that he was at peace. And it was a sign of love, that he loved us and he was still with us. Although Peter Bosco spent only 27 years on Earth, his family is convinced that he lives on, and not just in their memories. I believe it thoroughly and entirely and deep in my soul that life goes on, that there is life after death. Next on Sightings, did this young boy live another life? I know my little boy really experienced what he said he did. There's no doubt in my mind. A past life remembered. And later, one of the most paranormal encounters ever captured on videotape. Sally, stop it. She does this when she's upset. I'm sure that there's no person who hasn't experienced something phenomenal, something that they can't explain, or something that they interpret as almost miraculous. In Eastern religions, like Hinduism and Buddhism, proof of an afterlife doesn't come through ghosts or supernatural symbols. The proof they teach is within each and every one of us, because we are all the reincarnation of spirit energy that came before us. Well, it's a concept that's impossible to prove in a laboratory or to calculate mathematically, but easily explained by some remarkable children who speak to us about their past lives. The town of Hampton, Virginia is a curious blend of the very old and the very new. Hampton is home to America's oldest Anglican church, built in 1610, and one of the nation's oldest cemeteries, with grave markers dating back to the 17th century. But Hampton is also undergoing a 20th century renaissance. The town's progress has been watched closely by real estate agent Joanne McElroy Hill, who lives in neighboring Virginia Beach. Joanne is the mother of two children, Pierce and Mackenzie. In the spring of 1995, when Pierce was six and Mackenzie 16 months, Joanne took them on their first trip to Hampton. We were driving down a road that I had only been on a few times. He never had never been to that part of the town. And out of the clear blue, he said, Mom, please turn here, turn here. I want to see the boats. I want to go down by the water. And I don't see any water or any boats. But here is where he got real excited and said, turn, turn, I want you to turn here. And this is where I turned. And as I was turning the car, I was thinking, how does he know where we're going and what water is he talking about? What, where are the boats? The road eventually led them to the Hampton Roads Harbor, but this was not the final destination Joanne's son had in mind. As I approached a dead end, Pierce told me to turn again. And I turned and went about a block down, and he said, stop, Mom, there's the house, there's the house. And finally I asked him, Pierce, what does that house mean to you? I don't know the house. And he said, well, you should recognize it. We used to live there. And I was shocked. I, I felt like I had goosebumps all over my body. And I looked at the house he was talking about. It didn't bring any memories to me at all. I asked him at that point, I said, well, who lived there? He said, well, you and I lived there, and, I, and I, my dad lived there. And I lived there for a long time, Mom. Don't you remember? Don't you remember? I got to be very old. Then Pierce asked his mother to drive around the neighborhood, which seemed to spark in him a flood of eerie memories. I said, was Mackenzie with us? And he said, no, she wasn't my sister then. Mackenzie was my friend. He said, Mackenzie and I were best friends, and she lived in that house right over there. And he pointed about three doors away to another large old house. 
Joanne recalls being completely unnerved by the tone in her son's voice. At that time, I think I was in shock. I, I had goosebumps all over my arms. Pierce didn't sound like himself. He sounded very authoritative. His voice was a little more mature. It was so sure of himself. And I was, I was completely in shock. Joanne's concerns about what was happening to her son only grew when Pierce began to complain that his sister was constantly tagging along. He said, she's been following me for a long time. He said, in fact, when it was time for me to come down from heaven, Mackenzie wanted to come with me, and they had to say, no, Mackenzie, you can't go yet. It's not your time. For more than a year, Joanne kept the strange experiences to herself. But then she learned that she was not alone. At the same time that Pierce was recalling what seemed to be his past life, author Carol Bowman was documenting many similar experiences for her book, Children's Past Lives. Published in 1997, the book and a complimentary website have encouraged many otherwise reluctant parents and children to come forward with their past life experiences. There's a tremendous body of research at the University of Virginia Medical School done by Dr. Ian Stevenson who has collected over 2,600 cases of spontaneous past life recall in children. And in each of these cases, he meticulously researched what the child said, their behaviors, and was able to trace what they said to the identity of a specific person who had lived and died before this child was born. The stories in Bowman's book, it seems, are only the tip of the iceberg. Since publication, hundreds of families have contacted Bowman, including the Austrian family of Milford, Connecticut. A series of puzzling events shared by Patricia Austrian, her husband Donald, a physician, and their son Edward, have made them firm believers in the reality of children's past lives. Edward's first memories of a past life were verbalized when he was only 18 months old. Edward complained about a pain in his neck that he referred to as his shot. Well, coming from a clinical background, my initial impression was that Edward was talking about one of the shots his pediatrician had given him. I had never thought that he had more to say than that. As Edward grew, he complained more and more about his shot and suffered terribly from frequent bouts with respiratory infections. When Edward was four, he became very, very ill. One morning, Gil, Eddie's sister, pointed out to me that his throat appeared to be swollen. It was almost as if he was a teenager with an Adam's apple protruding. But it wasn't delineated. It was just very puffy. When I came over and felt his neck and, and I said, oh, my God, you know, given the knowledge that I have, I figured there was uh, the worst of all possible worlds you know, um, serious infection or cancer or something that would cut his life short. An ear, nose, and throat specialist diagnosed Edward with a thyroid glossal duct cyst, a condition that would require two separate operations. First, Edward would have to have his tonsils removed. Then, once he'd healed, doctors could perform a more complicated surgery to remove the cyst. By the time the normally stoic child arrived for his tonsillectomy, he was hysterical. What? Edward was very fearful of is not coming back again. We would not be there. He didn't want to be alone again. When the operation was over, Edward had a reaction completely unlike that of other children his age. Tears are running down his face, and he was so glad that we were there for him again. That's all Edward cared about. He said, I don't have to go back again. That really took me aback because we knew Edward was supposed to go back and be operated on for the thyroglossal duct cyst. While Edward was recovering from his first surgery, he told his parents an incredible story that seemed to explain much of his mysterious behavior in the hospital. He started to tell us how he had been in France he was 18. He was walking along, and he could hear the noise behind him. I was a soldier, and my name was James. And I was very tired, cold, and hungry, and I was scared. He said, I wanted to run, and my rifle was heavy. I wanted to go home. And also, I heard this bang, and I went 
turned around and a bullet had gotten shot, obviously, and it had gone through somebody. It went and it hit me right back here in the neck. And I remember just falling to the ground in extreme pain, just, um, it was unbelievable. And he said, I felt my throat fill with blood. I could feel the softy taste. I remember gasping for air and I started choking also and I just blacked out my dad knows that was it. And he said it wasn't supposed to be like this. I didn't even get started. Shortly after Edward revealed the story of his past life, the cyst that had caused the swelling in his neck suddenly and inexplicably disappeared. Just as Edward had predicted after the first operation, he did not have to return to the hospital. The Austrian family is convinced that there is a link between Edward's recollection and the miraculous healing that took place right after. I believe my son. I can't do anything else. It was just so uh, coincidental. It seemed that it, it couldn't have happened by chance, discussing a, a, a shot in a neck, describing a thyroglossal duct cyst in the same area. Uh, it's almost uh, that the child had, um, um, you know, what I see in, in uh, the alternative medicine circles now is almost having had guided imagery, uh, self-healing given to himself uh, in a subliminal sense, um, and that his healing process, for whatever reason, was miraculous. I know my little boy really experienced what he said he did. There's no doubt in my mind. You can tell. Um, I guess I've always believed the eyes are the mirror to one's soul. And when you look into the eyes of a small child who's four years old, and they are telling you this, and this is how it is, and there's no two ways about it, you know what you're dealing with is real. Because I've seen other cases like Edwards, I believe that his cyst was healed because he was able to express his past life memory, the trauma on the battlefield. And most significantly, Edward himself believes that the past life experiences he has recalled are not a dream nor a figment of his imagination. I just knew it couldn't have been a dream because my dreams when I was little, they were not that realistic. I mean. I wouldn't be thinking of war and everything, and I mean, I wasn't really exposed to that sort of things when I was younger, so it couldn't have been a dream. And when I was little, if I ever, those things would just terrify me when I was little, and I'd just try not to think about it, but there was that one thing that always stuck in my mind, and I knew that it was true, and I know that it happened. Everybody right now on this earth has a purpose in life to fulfill. I think that if everybody doesn't get to fulfill, they're supposed to fulfill in life, they'll have another life and they'll have another chance. And I think those keep getting chance after chance until you get to. And you feel good about it inside, and so does God. Coming up, violent paranormal activity captured on tape. Sally, stop it. Look, one's starting to bleed. An investigation at the most haunted house in America, next on Sightings. belief in ghosts or evil spirits is a very natural belief. It's very natural to think that there are beings that aren't looking out for us. Over the years, Sightings has researched thousands of supposedly haunted sites around the world. Most are intriguing, some are compelling, but only a handful, like the haunted neighborhood in Beacon, New York, are worthy of a full-scale investigation. And there is one case where the results have been so spectacular that we can say with confidence that this is the most haunted place in America. Sally, stop it. Look, one's starting to bleed. Oh, why don't you sit down? There's a little girl that's standing right there. Sally? Is that your name, Sally? My husband found this half fresh, half dead flower. Yeah, we've got a new scratch. Sally, make your presence known now. In 
This is where it all begins. A small town in America's heartland. A place where families raise their children and bury their loved ones. An ordinary place in every way, except one. Inside this quiet house on a shady street, a restless spirit began making its presence known to a young family when they moved in in January of 1993. The haunting experienced by Tony, Deborah, and their infant son, Taylor, was mild at first and seemed to center around Taylor's upstairs nursery. It was here that a disconcerting phenomenon began to emerge. Photographs of newborn Taylor were marred by strange blocks of free-floating light and shadow. It happened on roll after roll of film and with two different cameras. Afraid for her newborn child, Deborah asked psychic Barbara Connor to come to the house to try to determine what was causing the haunting activity. Connor felt that it was the spirit of a precocious little child named Sally, and Sally, Connor believed, was responsible for the eerie photographs. Trick photography expert Edson Williams examined the pictures for sightings. Photographic evidence is something I always question because my job is to create illusions photographically. But these several pictures that I was shown are very difficult to explain. The evidence of a bizarre haunting was so compelling that sightings sent a crew to investigate. Moments after this interview with Deborah began, there was a commotion in the living room. Something was wrong with Tony. Is it going? Gee, I hear, hear this. <laughs> Sally, stop it. Come on, I'm walking there. I'm walking there. Okay. She's right here, because it is freezing right here. It is freezing. I feel it. All you do is you feel this cold go through you. That's how I... Uh -huh. I could feel it. We're, we're interviewing. It's hot. We've turned the air conditioner off for sound purposes, but it is cold right here in this part of the room. This is the same thing that occurs when Holy she's scratched his face. Holy or he's had scratches across his forehead or down his arm. She does this when she's upset. I'm still shaking. <laughs> I know. My heart's pounding, too. But what had caused the vicious attack? Tony and Deborah asked Barbara Connor to try to communicate with Sally. How you doing? Feeling good? <laughs> What's this? That's what she just did. She just did this? Yeah. Later, reluctantly, Tony agreed to an interview. At this point in our investigation, he was still requesting that his identity be hidden. I, she scares the living daylights out of me, to be honest with you. I, I'm going to add this right now. She's right here with me right now. <laughs> I'm feeling something really cold shoot around my stomach. Um, he was obviously in pain. We asked Tony to describe what he was feeling, but Tony didn't respond. For a moment, he couldn't speak. It's really frightening. Was, she's just went right through my midsection. I don't, God, look, look. I oh, look, they're forming. can't come up with an explanation why she does this. Look, it's forming right there. She tends to do this to me because I upset her sometimes. I and she wants to be noticed. I think today. <laughs> Paranormal investigator Howard Heim brought in instruments in an attempt to measure the strange coldness and magnetic energy in the house. The video interference that you're seeing occurred during Heim's investigation. It's not the result of defective tape or camera malfunction, but rather some undetermined force within the home. You can feel it. Well, let's take a few minutes. So it's 77.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit in here. Just drop the point. It did instantly drop point then, then from, go, from point go, seven to just, point just, six. Just there. No, wait right there. It just dropped another point. It's dropping again. Point four. It dropped again. It's point three now. And I gradually and it dropped a point again. It's now point two. It keeps getting cooler in this room. Heim's instruments recorded both an increase in electromagnetism and a decrease in room temperature. But no instrument could explain what happened in the kitchen while Deborah was showing Barbara a teddy bear that had been inexplicably burned. My husband found this 
kind of half fresh, half dead flower singed around the edges. Could Sally have burned both the stuffed bear and the rose? We checked our raw field tape and discovered the rose on the windowsill unburned just moments before Tony had noticed it was singed and blackened. That's incredible. The interior leaves are burnt around the edges with no damage to the overlapping leaves, as if they were individually burned and then assembled. That is bizarre. You can't, you can't duplicate this. This cannot be duplicated. During our investigation, everyone who entered the house felt an eerie, ghostly presence. But only Tony claims to have seen Sally's human form. There was a little girl standing not more than three foot away from me, just as plain as you are to me now. Just standing there with this plain look on her face, just looking at me like she was curious about me too. Suddenly, the unflinching eye of the camera captured another bloody attack. What first appeared as scratches soon grew into long, thick, angry welts. There was no environmental or medical explanation. Look, one's starting to bleed. There's a whole new... Oh, look at that. Look oh at God. that. Oh, look at that. Oh, my God. It actually I just is around. <laughs> it's this nice dark one where it's bleeding. And this is like the most profound thing I've ever seen in all parapsychology. This is fact, and you have it on tape. This paranormal milestone was later analyzed by world-renowned parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor, who was the lead investigator on both the entity and poltergeist cases. The exciting thing for me as a researcher is that the camera didn't pull away. It was there the whole time, and that severely reduces the, the possibility of any kind of hoax. Our initial investigation had produced taped evidence unlike anything we'd ever seen before. I returned with our sightings team for a closer look. What I witnessed was disturbing. I feel it now blowing very strong yeah. in the back of my hand. Craig, she's over. Craig, she's over here. She's over here. Come over. Oh. Well, now that's very interesting. Be <laughs> okay if I sit down. First. Why don't you sit? Why don't you sit down? I can. T I can tell that uh, you're you're losing your breath right now. <laughs> Sally, what did I tell you? Sally, we see you. Uh, we know you're here. Whoever or whatever was responsible for these painful episodes struck repeatedly throughout the day. Then I was shocked to see mysterious welts forming on Tony's forehead. This whole spirit thing scares me. And it just some of the things she's done, she's lit fires. And I, you know, I think, well, if she wants to hurt me, why couldn't she just light me on fire or whatever she does to some of the other things around here? What was the source of the energy responsible for the terrifying phenomena occurring here? This question has never been completely answered, despite a long-term, six-year investigation. As we did with the Beacon, New York hauntings, sightings asked Peter James to investigate the Heartland ghost and attempt to make contact. How are you, dog? Peter says that he has had the ability to speak with the spirits of the dead since he was a child, and so we did not give Peter any of the details of the case. He never saw any videotape. He knew nothing specific about the haunting activity or the gruesome scratches. And he didn't know the family called the entity Sally. There's a little girl that's standing right there, right at the top of the stairs. Hello? 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 Can you speak to me, Sally? Is that your name, Sally? Tony, Deborah, and the sightings investigative team were amazed that Peter had correctly identified the entity. But would he succeed where parapsychologists had failed? Would Peter James be able to communicate with Sally? I'm getting a lot of resistance right here at the door, meaning whatever is in the room wants me out. Speak to me. Show yourself.
Suddenly, something lashed out at Tony with its full fury. You're in control here, so don't... don't... MC! No, don't be frightened. There's nothing to be afraid of. Remember, you're in control here. Who or what was attacking Tony? When sighting searched town records, a startling discovery confirmed Peter James's psychic interpretation. We found the death record for a child named Sally, date of death, 1905. Peter sensed an important link between this Sally and the house. Do you know if anyone medical lived in this house? There, were, there was a medical person? Yeah, because that's I feel very medical about this for some reason. In a turn of the century directory, we discovered that the house was once owned by a family doctor, and according to official records, the doctor moved out in 1906, just after Sally's death. Could there be a connection? During his visit to this community, Peter was drawn to a cemetery, one of the oldest in town. It was here that he had a vision of a little girl dying of pneumonia, and the doctor who couldn't save her. Peter said he heard a small voice calling him toward one particular grave. The gravestone was so old and weather-beaten that the inscription had disappeared. But when sightings checked cemetery records for that plot, we made a chilling discovery. Plot 1, 4th Row West, was the final resting place of a little girl named Sally Isabel Hall. It was the most bizarre evidence of a haunting that anyone on the sightings team had ever encountered, and we were capturing it on videotape. Believe what you will about the source of the paranormal activity here. Those bloody welts that began to appear all over Tony's body didn't come from any earthly source that we could detect. They just appeared seemingly out of nowhere and right on camera. Next on Sightings, investigators and researchers move closer to the source of this disturbing paranormal violence. During the last 20 years, I've investigated about 850 cases, and during that time, I have never come across anything like this. In every room we're in, wherever we are, we are never alone. We are surrounded by the invisible world. Why the supposed ghost of an angry little girl named Sally chose Tony as the object of her rage is still unknown. But what is known is that once the bloody scratches and welts began to appear, they just kept coming, first on his arm, then on his stomach, then on his forehead, then on his back. It wasn't a medical condition or an allergy or a cat or, as far as we could honestly tell, a hoax or self-inflicted. So what was it? Now that Peter James's psychic visions of a turn-of-the-century child named Sally had been validated through historical records, sightings began an unprecedented investigation into what we believe to be the most haunted house in America. Joined by parapsychologist Carrie Gaynor, an investigative team returned to the house in America's heartland to set up an arsenal of electronics. Particular attention was given to paranormal hotspots throughout the house where ghostly activity had been seen or felt in the past. The kitchen, the living room, the master bedroom, and the room where Sally seemed to feel most at home, the nursery. Oscilloscopes, frequency counters, and surveillance cameras would monitor the house continuously. Much of the equipment was concentrated in the nursery. One camera position was at the top of the stairs, where Peter James had claimed to have encountered the wrathful entity known as Sally. Two cameras were placed in the living room area, where the sightings investigative team had first witnessed bloody welts form spontaneously on Tony. We were now set to monitor any anomalous activity that might occur inside the house. We turned the family kitchen into a control center. Audio transmitters were placed around the house, and separate video recorders were assigned to each camera. We also implemented a handheld thermal imaging system. Any unusual cold spots would turn the normally red tones of human flesh to blue. Kerry Gaynor recommended that our investigation be conducted in as close to dark as possible. We were determined to find an answer to what had become the most baffling haunting in the history of sightings. All right, why don't you make a request, anything that comes to your mind. Sally, could you do this for me, please? A 
the bike to, for you to show them that you're really here. No one in the room heard a response. Just then, Tony felt a now familiar sensation of cold around his torso. Yeah, we got a new scratch. Yeah, we got fresh blood here. This wasn't here two minutes ago. And the bizarre events continued through the night. At the top of the stairs, our frequency counter suddenly and uncharacteristically jumped from 399 to 575 megahertz, indicating an electrical disturbance. At this same spot earlier in the day, one of our surveillance cameras had picked up a lot of interference, something a closed circuit camera isn't supposed to do. And in the nursery, video signals began to drift and then completely disappear. The next morning, a sense of calm returned to the house, but for the paranormal investigators on scene, it had been a night to remember, filled with historic and unexplained events. Yesterday and last evening, I spent about 14 straight hours here investigating this case. During that time, there were 11 separate instances of scratch marks on his body. Some of the scratches were very thin, and some were very thick, welt-like scratches that were really quite frightening. During the last 20 years, I've investigated about 850 cases, and during that time, I have never come across anything like this. And there was at least one other bizarre phenomenon that night that went undetected by Gaynor and the rest of the sightings team. I'd like to, for you to show them that you're really here. The mysterious rumble, or moan, wasn't discovered until later, when a team heard a tape of the investigation during an editing session. Two audio experts were hired to analyze the tape for sightings. Their findings? The sound was neither electronic nor human. But what about those scratches? Couldn't Tony's affliction have a medical rather than a paranormal explanation? I've been researching a skin condition called dermatographism. And what that is, is a person can scratch himself and nothing will show up until about 10 or 15 minutes later. The references that I've looked at so far do not include bleeding with this skin condition. And certainly in this case, there have been bleeding scratch marks. If we just drop our skepticism just for a moment, and as a researcher, I'm not really allowed to do that, but there's a real human angle here, and that is a man's being terrorized. She scares the living daylights out of me. Something is happening to him without his say, without his control, and he's got to be thinking to himself, well, if this could happen, what else could happen? When the exorcism failed to call off the vicious attacks on Tony, and after three years of disturbing ghostly activity, the family finally gave in and moved out of the house. Did Sally go with them? We asked psychic Peter James to return to the now empty house with the sightings investigative team. Their mission? To see if Sally was still at home. Because much of the haunting activity had been reported after dark, we used night vision lenses as Peter James conducted a psychic survey of the house. Okay, we're good. I want to go in this room first. Our nighttime is their daytime. There's someone, there's someone, there is an entity in this room right now. No doubt in my mind. Peter felt that the eerie force was leading him down the hallway and into the former nursery, where Sally's presence had always been felt most intensely. You all right? Yeah, I'm fine, just burned. Is this unusual? Mm -hmm. like yeah, she's, oh man, really burned. Sally has apparently burned before. A rose, a teddy bear, and now a person. Something is burning my face, like, right now. Peter James was visibly shaken by the painful encounter. Wow. Sally, you be nice. The next day, sightings conducted the world's first real-time online ghost investigation. Carrie Gaynor was answering user questions in a live computer forum when the former residents of the house dropped in unexpectedly. Within minutes, so did Sally. Whoa! 
So did you feel it here or down here? Where did you feel it? Kind of like all across here. Oh, the whole face? Yeah. The first reaction from the online audience was skeptical. How do we know this is not a hoax? Well, I don't know. I'll let you answer that. We got, we got, we got 15 people observing this right now. In the last five, in the last five minutes, three scratches appeared on his body in full view of eight witnesses. And those scratches were not the last. Just after the online session wrapped up, Sally, who always seemed to crave attention, struck again with a new viciousness no one on our team had witnessed before. You physically felt that? Yeah, that hurt. Describe to me again what you, what you felt. This sharp thing felt like somebody stabbing something in my back. It would be more than two years before a sightings team would return to the site of the Heartland ghost haunting. There had been several tenants in the interim, but none had had a run-in with Sally. It looks the same. Not much has changed. Peter entered the house with some trepidation. Sally, I'm back. Sally. Make your presence known, Sally. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that she is here. None whatsoever. I sense um, the same kind of activity, however, to a lesser degree. And I would attribute that to the fact that the young man that lived here is not here. And I believe that Sally or the perpetrator, if you will, that did all the scratching, uh, had a thing for him that, that, that disliked him immensely. But the activity remains the same. Sally is still here and active. Tony stayed away from the house on our most recent visit, but Deborah brought sightings up to date on her husband's progress. He went through an awful lot each time the sightings crew came up, and it was quite traumatizing to him. And he's now had a like, cooling off, a healing period where he can feel free without, with, with, with the knowledge that nothing is going to sneak up on him and scratch him. In Sally's eyes, this is her home. And when you enter the domain, if you will, of a ghost, they let you know that you're invading their space. So the family just happened to move in and bumped into Sally, literally. Things that go bump in the night, well, she bumped back. But Deborah has lingering fears that Sally will rear her ugly head in their new home and torment Tony once again. Today, I had Peter come over and um, walk through our now permanent house to kind of check over whether we are being bothered over there. I got an immediate sense that it would be very unlikely that they would have any kind of a haunting activity in, in, in the new house. The new house is clean because I believe that houses are haunted and not people. According to Peter James, Sally will haunt this house in America's heartland for many years to come until she realizes that her physical body no longer exists and her spirit can finally rest in peace. Next on Sightings, the dead speak from beyond the grave and change the lives of the living. Edward's experience has given me a lot more spiritual understanding. We're spiritual beings. We may end up going from one life to the next. This phenomenon is part of our experienced reality. It's been reported since the beginning of time. It's come up in all cultures. The dramatic rescue of a drowning child because of the intervention of his deceased grandfather. The appearance of a unique white bird as a sign from a son who had committed suicide. The reincarnation of a young soldier in the form of a compassionate child. The mysterious phenomenon of spontaneous scratches on a man's body. At first, these experiences appear distinct and unrelated, but they all share one thing in common. They beg us to ask the question, is there life after death and why? For those who have had first-hand experience with the afterlife, pondering such questions has profoundly affected this life. In the last uh, 10, 15 years, I've been quite ill, gone through a couple heart surgeries, 
And beyond the slightest doubt in my mind, if it wasn't for my son, Walt, I would have lost my home, my business, everything. Again, I believe in my heart this was all part of God's plan. Edward's experience has given me a lot more spiritual understanding. We are spiritual beings. We may end up going from one life to the next. Who knows? Maybe we're like the Hindus who figure we have to get placed on Earth uh, each time until we get our lives right. It's an ongoing part of the Spirit's life. We're just, we're just another passenger sitting by him on the train, and they're corresponding with us. They're trying to find out about us, and we're trying to find out about them. And when we move out, there's going to be someone else sitting in that seat, and I think it's going to take the same role in just a diff with different turns. Despite the strong-willed beliefs of those personally affected, there is a naturally skeptical side in all of us. Those who have dedicated their lives to explore such phenomena have struggled to arrive at objective answers. For example, is there such a thing as a truly haunted house? Or could ghost-like activity be the result of some unknown aspect of the human mind? To say whether or not Julie is causing the activity or is just being used as an energy source for the haunting, it's a very fine line. Uh, I, my suspicion is that you have two separate things going on. You have a little girl's ghost in the house, which would be here whether Julie was here or not. I think Julie's presence in the house has kicked off another set of dynamics where possibly she is acting as a poltergeist agent through a means we cannot explain right now. It is equally difficult to rationally understand the concept of reincarnation. I think through the process of reincarnation, we're given a chance to learn a very difficult lesson, which is how to be truly loving and compassionate. And I think it's something that we can't learn in just one lifetime, so we experience ourselves, our souls, in many different roles. Questions seem to generate even more questions. Will we ever, in this life, find an answer? This phenomenon is part of our experienced reality. It's been reported since the beginning of time. It's come up in all cultures. So the idea that it's fraudulent is just kind of a paranoid idea. Um, as to what the real explanation is, none of us know at this point. But it's here to stay, and it's a major chunk of human experience. That to ignore it is to retreat into ignorance. To pursue it is to pursue one of the most provocative mysteries of our time. For the people we've met on this program, the afterlife is alive and well. It's a tangible experience capable of transcending time and space. But what about those of us who have yet to see a ghost or sense a past life or receive an otherworldly sign? Well, there is also an afterlife. It may be a homemade quilt or a lock of hair or family tradition passed on that whispers, I'm still here. For this special edition of Sightings, I'm Tim White.